And you all know that uh, we have had a fantastic photographer with us here this week. Um, and I'm very happy to say that um, I've been able to, I don't know how, but I've been able to convince Paul to talk about his photography uh, and to be in front of the camera instead of behind it. Uh, so uh, Paul will tell us a little bit about how he uses photography um, you know, to communicate uh, and to make science more approachable, which I think is a, a lovely way to conclude uh, to conclude our sessions. So I will share your presentation, Paul. And you are good to go. So if you can stand here close to the mic. Bit of encouragement for Paul. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this is nervous. Okay, um, when I was going through my extensive portfolio, I happened to find some images uh, that's gonna kind of appeal to you guys. So bear with me on this, hopefully they do. Um, one of the things I like to do is, is show some detail when you are working with uh, various academics. So a bit of a test, does anybody know what that is? Anybody? No? Bit more of a clue. Does anybody know what that is? No. Uh, no. Anybody know what that is? We're getting closer. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> it was shot from that. So this was actually a car um, that a client has. It was about £100,000 worth of... Um, working DeLorean. And uh, this was shot, this particular one, in, um, in Manchester in a, in a studio. And um, I had to take it on the basis that he couldn't drive it really down the road because it was causing too many accidents. Because um, he would love going up to bus stops and um, pulling up against the park. There's about 10 people there. And he'd open the door very carefully and ask, what year is it? And every man just put it down and just drove away. So um, tough crowd. Um, uh, this was quite interesting. This was a, um, a guy who uh, developed the Lockheed Hercules um, with NATO. And um, the, uh, the brief was to show him with the plane. Well, obviously, we can't get the plane in there, but he had a very small model of it. So... One of the questions I actually asked him, what really inspired you from a very early age to, to go into this industry? He said, I used to love making paper planes. So I quickly made a paper plane up and got him to pose with it. And you can see from this one, you're kind of looking at him and the plane. The other one, you've then got time to explore the image. And that's the paper plane. He's looking away, I don't know, the future, the past. I have no idea. So, moving on, um, this was a publishing company, and this guy is a forensic scientist. Um, he specializes in serial killers, so he has to assess them, whether they could be let out. And so they said, right, we want something where the guy's with his books and that sort of thing. I said, okay, yes, I can do that. And I thought, well, I don't, you know, it's been done before. I've seen this a hundred times, but let's, let's try and break it up a little bit. Let's show it as a sort of a broken, fractated sort of, you know, image of the mind, which he's dealing with. Um, and they said, yeah, yeah, we kind of like that. Have you got anything else? Yeah, I did some more while we were there. And this is sort of much more open, pure white space, just him floating there. And then I thought, well, I fancy something a bit more grungy than that. So we've posed him like that and we've used a few filters to throw him in and out of focus. You notice he's got a corduroy jacket on, which is Fessor stuff, isn't it? Um, so moving it on, they eventually went for that. That was the final shot, which I was kind of disappointed after all the other ones. What was, do you prefer any of the others? Or is that your favorite? No, no. Okay. Okay, broken mind. Um, ESOF 2016 it was the first time I actually worked with um, some academics and um, it was really interesting actually uh, one of the guys I met there was does anybody know you know him don't you Brian Schmidt anybody else know him no no 
No, yeah, okay. So this is what you'll see with a lot of your portraits that I've taken. I've given you plenty of room either side, so you can put words either side. It's really, really useful for you guys, rather than being shot in normal portrait mode. Um, and he said, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm you know, a cosmos cosmologist. I want something that's a bit more oomphy. So we overlay some galaxies for him. So it ended up looking like that. And I think he's used it on various things throughout his presentations and so forth. Um, and then I did see one person there. He's uh, a journalist, a Dutch journalist. And I thought, they're really cool glasses, but who does he remind me of? And I said, would you mind just sort of turning around and posing and sticking your tongue out? And there, I thought, the sun, <laughs> who does that remind me of? Um, but yeah, huge fun. Um, that was about three days as well, uh, working with these guys. Uh, props. You would have all experienced a prop while you've been, you've all been holding something up because um, it really drops inhibitions. These are the ones at ESOF. Uh, and you can see people really change. But try and use props. Something in the background. That's a filtration, mini filtration system they use. And I reversed the image, obviously. They're not twins. Um, um, plenty of sparks. That's easily achieved. If you ever want to reproduce that, you need really cheap welding rods and some really cheap steel. And it will produce that. You can't use all the modern ones. They don't work anymore. Um, this is quite an interesting way of doing things. If you hold something much closer to the lens, it will be nat not naturally out of focus, but it's useful to have it out of focus because then you can concentrate on the on the person behind. Unfortunate choice of hat probably in the current climate, but there we go. Um, uh, this is a series of shots that I produced um, for um, Nutsford Town Council. That doesn't really mean a lot for most of you guys here, but it's not far down the road. And it was looking at the individual shops, the independent shops. Any idea what that woman does for a living? Anybody? No. A what? Yes, thank you. Someone got it in the end. Bring a couple of uh, butternut squashes and, and we'll dress you up like Karma Miranda. So it's things like that. It's people having fun, really. Um, RL Space. Have we got anybody here? From? No? Okay. Uh, Really interesting. This was a, an outside shot that they wanted, um, and was that was actually composited together from individual shots um, because it was so big the building, and even with a wide angle. Um, so we stitched that image together to create one final image. Very bright day. And this is one of the things that, if you ever get an opportunity to purchase a polarizing filter, it's one of the few things that you can't replicate. Um, in Photoshop. So if you get a polarizing filter, it makes the sky go blue, saturates the colors and takes out a lot of sh shine. Um, Close-up shots, I've no idea what that is. Don't know, that's something they make. It's about 10, 10 mil square. Um, that shot with a macro lens um, through to bigger stuff. Um, Give it size, size and perspective by putting a human in there. It gives you an idea uh, the size of this chamber. It was um, solid stainless steel. Um, there's another version. That one was backlit. So that was um, a flash gun firing away and wrapping around. We use the reflective surface, which just gives you a different look. White space, really useful. Um, most people want to be in front of the something or nearer something. If you can grab some white space, you can put anything behind it. Go wide, still the white space with a wide angle lens. Generally, you wouldn't use a wide angle lens when it comes to portraits, particularly on women. You, you'll never be forgiven. But um, with a man, you can look a bit different, a bit more pushing it forward out there. That's just shot with a wide angle lens. And there's another version of it with um, some treatment in post-production. So you can see detail and he's looking at you. You can see his watch. You kind of feel a bit uncomfortable in looking at you. Main thing is to have fun. Um, if you've got cameras, 
but really don't worry about speed settings and things. Whack them on auto and just go out there and have fun with it. And you can see um, props. There's somebody here. And there's the uh, Claire Malone. And um, everyone's favorite captain. So, well done, guys. Thank you for making me feel comfortable getting into the right spirit of it all. Thank you so much. Great stuff. And a lovely, lovely group photo uh, that we will, of course, uh, share after the conference. So yeah, thanks, Paul, for that. Um, I thought that was uh, interesting to um, get uh, Paul's ideas behind the camera, you know, which are also part of, of communicating um, and, and help communicate science. Right, uh, let's proceed with our closing. Uh, I will now ask uh, Anka, who is the esteemed chair of the, the, um, the PARI working group uh, that organizes the PARI conferences to tell us a little bit more about the work of the working group before we uh, wrap up. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, just to give you an insight about who's actually behind this PARI conference, like who is working and checking out like what is the program, what will the program, uh, who's reviewing all these abstracts, uh, how we get this conference done. And in the end, it's like the RISE working group and RISE stands for the Research Infrastructure Communication Engagement. Um, at the moment, we are more than 30 members actually, what's quite good. Um, not all active at the moment, but uh, they are come and go. So it's quite a nice working group. Most of them that are here at the moment. I also had like talks during the conferences. Um, yeah, it's part of the ERF. Um, ERF stands for Association of European Level um, Research Infrastructures. So they have 18 members. Uh, for example, ALBA is a part of it. Um, um, ISIS is a member. So different institutes and on European level. Um, but the RISE Working Group is actually not closed for the international ones. So we're always happy that when you want to volunteer or also be part of the organization committee or scientific organization committee, you're always welcome to join us in the RISE Working Group meeting. There's also one just behind this conference. So if you have time and you want to support us and join us, you're welcome to come. Um, otherwise, it's also a virtual option. So if you're on a run, so we have one Tabea, maybe we will see you later, <laughs> maybe virtually, <laughs> if that's possible. But yeah, you're welcome. Um, so what else? Um, we meet twice uh, in a year usually. So in person or virtually, what else is possible? I mean, the last two years were a little bit because of COVID. So we're just like virtual meetings. Um, but in the future, we want to go back to see us in person because of the exchange. You see it also like here on a conference. It's way more better if you are in person. Um, yeah, better exchange options. It's more affordable, I guess. And yeah, what else? We had uh, two years ago or three years ago at the ESOF, we had a common booth. Um, we did in Toulouse this um, European Science Open Forum, the Science in the City Festival inside the city yeah with your fusion um, sko was there they had like hands-on activity how to build a telescope with pasta and marshmallows <laughs> great action actually <laughs> but also we had uh, from the tomb we had like the fission reactor a kind of like a lego like a model made out of lego and you could um, move it around and we had like from fusion kind of games on the tablet so a lot of activities there and there were a lot of people coming over and were really interested in the science that we do. And it was just like another target group that we actually could reach and also in another country, especially for us. Yeah. Um, after the conference, before the next conference. <laughs> so if you're interested in support us, you're always welcome. So if you want to get involved, please contact Mathieu our vice chair, <laughs> or directly to me, that's also okay. Um, we're happy if you join. Um, at the end of this great PARI conference, actually, um, I want to quote someone because in the morning, I just received an email from one person who attended remotely. And she once that I 
tell you um, to say thank you very much for going down the hybrid route for Paris 2020. It would not have been able to attend the conference due to both personal and professional reasons. And I was delighted to discover there was an affordable option to attend virtually and register last minute. So I guess the thanks goes mainly to you, Mathieu, and Sarah, of course, like all your team in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anke. And uh, yeah, the hybrid route was um, a priority, actually, the, the whole time we wanted to organize uh, Paris since the start of the pandemic, we were clear that we wanted to have both the in-person networking aspect, which is so essential to building those connections, but also to make it accessible and, and inclusive to, um, to people around the world, so to colleagues around the world. So. Uh, the organizing committee really pushed to, um, to make it possible. Okay. Um, so I will, I will wrap up. I do have a, a, yeah, a, a quite a long list of things to get through. My team likes to joke that uh, I always speak too much. Uh, so I will try and, and keep my remarks to time and this might be the very first session at Paris 2022 where we finish early. So I will, uh, I will do my best. Um, I just want to go back to something I touched upon um, in, in my opening remarks about why SKO wanted to host Paris 2022. And I have been asked a question a few times by, by colleagues, you know, why, why us, why here? And there were really several reasons. Um, one of them was that we, uh, we wanted uh, participants to have the opportunity to experience the Blue Dot Festival uh, has a, a great example of, of unconventional outreach. And I'm, I'm very happy to some of our, that some of our colleagues are staying uh, for a couple of days or, or even the whole weekend uh, in, in a couple of instances, even camping here at Jojo Bank uh, to experience the festival. And it's a, it's a really unique, combination of, of music, art, and, and science. So that was one of the main drivers to, to bring uh, Parry to, um, to Giorgio Bank, hence this time of year, because the Blue Dot Festival is always uh, at this time of year in July. And the other reason from, a, from an SKO perspective was really to uh, you know, bring a community of practice together to, to discuss topics of interest. We're a, a, a new research infrastructure, we're a new intergovernmental organization and we uh, we very much learn from others who've, who've been there before and we, we talk a lot with colleagues from other organizations to understand uh, you know how they've got to where they are so it's very important for us as an organization to to talk to to fellow organizations uh, it was also an opportunity uh, to bring people in this brand new building that we have that was uh, you know uh, designed and built for us and i remember standing right here on a patch of grass a few years ago you know thinking this will be where the lectern is in the in the council chamber of the sko intergovernmental organization and so from from that point on we really wanted to to bring events here um, our, our director general likes to say that uh, we want the sko and the headquarters to become a nexus for uh, radio astronomy really you know bringing people together um, to, to discuss expertise. And this is something we wanted to do for communications as well and, and public awareness. So there were many, many reasons to, to bring Parry to uh, Giorgio Bank and to the SKO uh, Global Headquarters. So I'm, I'm really happy that we were uh, able to, um, to do this. Um, maybe I'll, I'll summarize a little bit the, the program, uh, uh, to, you know, about what we talked over the past three days. Um, so we had three keynotes that uh, I think were, were really inspiring and excellent from uh, Teresa Anderson, the director of the Giorgio Bank Center for Engagement, uh, from Claire Malone as a physicist and as a disabled person working in STEM on her experiences and on science, and uh, from uh, Dr. Marga Gual Soler as a, as a science diplomat about the um, the role of research infrastructures in society. So these were really the sort of um, cornerstone, you know, the pillars of Barry 2022 in terms of topics that we wanted to talk about. Um, you know, unconventional outreach, 
uh, equity, diversity and inclusion in STEM and, uh, and societal impact. Um, of course, we touched, on, we touched on outreach, we touched on public relations strategy, uh, we touched on social media and TikTok, um, we touched on science communication research, so we addressed many, many topics of interest and I, and I hope that the, all of those sessions and all of those talks were, uh, were interesting to people and we also had the opportunity to uh, share our skills and a couple of our colleagues here from the SKO Compass team ran workshops where they shared their experiences uh, of graphic design and, and, and video production. So I, I hope it was a success. I hope the sessions and all the talks were uh, valuable to you. Um, you know, Parry is very much about lessons learned and about hands-on knowledge. And I hope this was the case this year, that there's a lot that you can take home and, uh, and, and use in your, in your work for your uh, research infrastructures. Um, let me perhaps give you a few statistics, uh, actually, that I have been asked to prepare. I have a committee meeting after this. And I've been asked to uh, prepare a report on Paris, so this will be a, a very, uh, very hot report. Uh, so I did last night uh, put a few statistics together that I have here. Uh, so we had 142 participants uh, in total at this workshop. Uh, as of this morning, we had 60 people here in person at the SKO uh, headquarters and 82 uh, connected virtually. And in terms of nationalities, I was actually quite, uh, you know, blown away. I mean, the, you know, the SKO was quite international, but those numbers were very impressive. Uh, we had 24 nationalities uh, registered for the conference. Uh, we had people from pretty much every continent. Um, and we had people from Australia. We had people from Brazil, from Colombia, from India, from Japan, from the Philippines, from South Africa, and from throughout Europe uh, participating. So it was... Uh, it was very impressive to see. Also impressive was um, the 53 talks that were given, uh, which is you know quite quite a lot to get through in uh, in two and a half days. Uh, 50 presenters uh, from uh, 14 countries. Um, so those are the sort of headline numbers for you um, from Paris 2022. 